Wow, this, uh, what a great series of talks so far, talking about the value of data, um, the connectivity of data. You know, I love that we've got a cloud first mentality, but the sexy stuff seems to be happening on the edge. So I love that conversation about 5G. Today, my conversation is a little bit different, very, very technical. Hopefully everybody's ready to calculate and do a lot of math. As you can see, I dress for the occasion. We're going to talk about data gravity. Who here, by just a quick show of hands, is familiar with the concept of data gravity? So this is a term new to me, sort of. So here's, uh, um, let me make sure I'm going in the right direction. Point to that thing. There we go. So uh, data gravity, it was a phrase coined by a guy, Dave, Dave McCrory, about a little, little over nine years ago, where he said, consider data like, uh, like mass. Like the larger that a mass gets, it affects the force of gravity and it draws applications and services to it, right? As we just heard from Flex Central a moment ago, we would all agree, I think in this room and here, that um, data, the new gold, the new oil, whatever it is, it's the commodity of the entire world. The way I like to think about it is there is no idea on earth today that isn't digital and live in a data center. Somebody's data center. The formula for Coca-Cola isn't in a safe, it's in a data center somewhere. So as data grows and accumulates in size, um, it begins, instead of you pushing the data towards services or applications, you begin pulling applications and services to the data. And we were able to find the perfect encapsulation of this. Oh, right here. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, data gravity. I can see, has anybody seen the neon cat before? I got one person under 30 here in the room that has seen this. Here's what's interesting. This is a gift that was made about 11, 2011, 2012. And at the time that it was created, would you believe this was the fifth most watched video on YouTube? <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of millions of views. And so if you think about that for a second, this little gift gets po populated up on YouTube. If you're thinking of trying to uh, put that into context, how much energy that is, how many disk spindles that is, how much weight that is of that data living in a data center, um, how much energy it costs to power it, how much energy it takes to cool it off of that little GIF. But it gets even better because the next thing that it did was it created its own merch brand. This is classic data gravity. So you've got this piece of data and it begins generating in e-commerce sites more and more and more data. Then it does this. Then it generates its own game in Steam. Even more data gets even better. Social media, blogosphere. I can't make this up. Go look this for yourself. Whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, etc. The data keeps growing and as you can see, it's drawing it's drawing the applications and it's drawing the services to it. It's not pushing the data out to those items. Um, Etsy, for any of the artists in the room, I have three daughters who are all art majors. I'm very familiar and so is my pocketbook with Etsy. <laughs> any of you got to do that before? And lastly, this is my all-time favorite. It literally made a $4 million market cap Bitcoin. I didn't think that was true. We went and looked it up. I think it's still around uh, $100,000 in market cap today. That GIF created all of this data and drew all of these services and all these applications to it. And so as we were just heard from the previous speaker talking about the value of data and how we're gonna use data and how we're gonna mine data, but there's a real risk there that McCrory and many others are wrestling with, with right now, which is the gravitational pull. Once data gets to a certain size, it's almost impossible to move it. In fact, is anybody here familiar with um, the Apple service, I'm sorry, the uh, Amazon service of uh, snowmobile? They load up a great big van filled with essentially storage infrastructure and they come to your facility and they load up hundreds of petabytes of data to put it onto their platform. Why would they do that? Because even if you have a low latency 10 gigabit fiber connection up to the cloud, it would take you three years to move all that data. So imagine that, how much data that is. So what's a more modern um, illustration of data gravity? Maybe you're familiar with this, this little application, Zillow. Remember, once upon a time, you would take a picture of a property, you'd write up a description of it, and you'd post it up in the ML MLS, and people would log in and look at it. They wouldn't modify it, they wouldn't share it, you just looked at it, talked to your customer about it, and on you went. 
That doesn't work anymore. With Zillow, not only do you have this massive database, but what else is it drawing to it? It's drawing, for example, municipality data. Has anybody here used Zillow or realestate.com or any of those before? Oh, come on. Every single one of you has looked at it somewhere. I wonder what it's like to live in that country. It pulls up, at least here in the States, it pulls up all the municipality information. You can see what the tax records are. When was it last sold? Who owned it? On and on and on. You pull that information in. That is, again, part of data gravity. This data gets so big. These data sets get so big, it, the forces come along and draw things to it. Um, what else can we do with Zillow? School data. I can't even tell you how many times as we've looked at moving, what schools are in the area, and it's all tied in and related to this data. Again, drawing. And then lastly over here, just a quick area to uh, illustrate, is um, all the other agencies that are tied into that. Every real estate agency that's tied into that, the MLS, the social media platforms that are tied to that. Um, there's even a Zillow Apple TV app. Unbelievable. That's a little too much time, I think, on your TV. But there's an instance where an application, a data set gets so large that the forces of gravity begin applying and it's pulling services into it and it's pulling applications into it because you can't move the data set, which on the one hand is awesome. I mean, all of us here hopefully are related in some way or the other of the commodity of the new world. 50 years ago, what was the commodities of the world? Steel, right? The companies were IBM and GE and um, Eastman Kodak, anybody remember Eastman Kodak? Yeah, I got a couple nodders. The one who knew what Neon Cat was doesn't know, but Eastman Kodak was a film company. A hundred years ago, right, it was um, Armor pa Packing Company, which surprises everybody. What was that? That was meat packing. We used to have meat packing industry and AT&T and all these other industries. The point there was all different commodities were the largest industries on earth. Today, what are the largest businesses on earth? the trillion dollar market cap companies, whether it's social media or e-commerce or cloud or whatever it is, it's data. It's about data. But as the data sets get bigger, especially as we move to machine to machine learning, the data sets are gonna get much, much larger. And so now we got a conundrum. How's it gonna impact our infrastructure? For example, we've heard several people talking about how they're optimizing uh, their networks, how they're optimizing uh, their, their algorithms to search for data. I'm in the data center business with QTS, and we look at how we've uh, digitized our entire environment so that we can begin pulling analytics out, so we can begin getting performance data. How do we partner with telecom uh, carriers and providers so that we can manage the forces that are coming in, the applications and services, as we have these huge data sets and these massive core data centers? We're asking ourselves, is the world gonna become just a giant data center? Like, how do we do this? Uh, many of you maybe own a data center in your own facility. More and more, those data sets aren't working there. They're not working on the prim. They have to push them into either a core data center or a prim data center. So we're all wrestling, and you'll hear throughout this weekend, the infrastructure, the threat to data. I thought this was a really interesting one. Anybody here familiar with the NSA released a report that said cybercrime will be the greatest transfer of wealth in human history? It's true. Our own uh, security agency released that as they look at it. And when you're talking about data sets that get so large, well, so what are those data sets? I mean, we've just sequenced the human genome, and now we're, right, we've consumerized that, and so you've got 23andMe and all these other folks that are coming to that data, all that Zillow data we talked about before. While that's amazing, it's also what happens if, as they pull in these apps or they pull in these services, it makes us much more vulnerable because it gives us an opportunity for someone to penetrate the data, and now what do they know? Who bought that home? Uh, what's going on? What transactions? Is it on the market? Can I go by there? So we're evaluating what's the threat to the data. If I've got the most valuable commodity of the world and it's making these giant uh, uh, data sets, what, I don't have to steal anything. What if I disrupt it? What if I just impact the integrity of the data? So blockchain and other ledger communities are coming along. So as you hear all this conversation this weekend, one of the things that we're thinking about is how do we help mitigate the threat, whether it's in our industry or our partner industries, against data and the forces that data gravity bring. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is the advantage of data gravity. 
we've taken advantage of gravity uh, in our life here. We use it to make food with wine and cheese. We use it in the area of medicine with blood, right? We use gravity to separate blood in the medical field. We use it in nuclear uh, power plants to drop the rods down in. So how can we take advantage of it in, in our own lifetime? Well, for the data center industry, some of the things we're looking at is how do we get our infrastructure much more efficient so we can host more denser, faster, easier um, interactions. That's one way we hope to take advantage of it and bring the services and the applications in, allow more mining to happen. But just on a personal level, an idea that struck me the other day that I love, back to the human genome, is uh, right now there are very few, has anybody here done the 20 and 3 and Me or anything like that? I got 30 seconds, here's the deal. I thought this was fascinating. Most people are resistant to doing that today, but what happens in three to five years from now when 30, 40, 50% of the population has their DNA up in there? And you know that if you go and you uh, investigate that, it can tell you what, not just are you prone to sweet or salty, but how to best treat your anxiety, how to mitigate uh, health risks. That is a way the whole population, I believe, is going to be drawn towards that data set, and that's going to be an example of data gravity in our lifetime. Thank you very much for having me today. Enjoy your show.